You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Rodrigo Reyosa. The Renegade Star Series, books one through three by J.N. Cheney. Jace Hughes is a renegade. That means taking almost any job that comes his way, no matter the situation. So long as he can keep his ship floating, he's free to live the life he wants. But that all changes when he meets Abigail Pryor, a nun looking for safe passage out of the system. Too bad there's something off about the cargo she's carrying. Jace knows he shouldn't ask too many questions, but when odd sounds start coming from inside the large metal box, he can't help but check it out. Big mistake. The Renegade Star box set includes the first three books in the series, 900 plus pages, 300 five-star reviews and counting. Find out why people are so intrigued by this thrilling science fiction epic. You won't believe the twists and turns this series takes, or the secrets that get revealed. The Renegade Star series by J.N. Cheney. I'd also like to tell you about my friend Crystal Pico Watanabe of Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. Visit Crystal and her team of eight people who help her provide services to fiction authors. Crystal's full slate of services now include beta reading, manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors, you can also inquire about putting your books in her Book Lover's Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. This is free for authors for a limited time. PicosHouse.com for all your book publishing needs. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Rodrigo Ray Rosa on the show with me today. Rodrigo has a fantastic new book. It's called Chaos, a Fable. And this is a gorgeous book, uh, y'all. I have it in my hands. And it's a, uh, it's a powerful book. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Uh, welcome to the show, Rodrigo. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, my f- first serious memory, actually, I, I was reading a book by Borges. I was studying, starting to study medicine at the time, and at the university, at the college where I was studying, there was a, a teacher of... Um, at that moment, he was teaching Spanish, liter- uh, Latin American literature, and he gave a lecture on Borges, who I had been reading coincidentally. And one of those days, I don't remember exactly, I, I was at home reading uh, Clon Ukbar, or Bisterchu, one, one of Borges' first short stories. And I decided I would drop out of medical school and start trying to write. So it's a very... That's clear for some reason. <laughs> yeah, that's a that had to be a, a pretty strong calling, uh, if you will, to uh, to drop out of medical school to to be a writer. That you must have felt a um, like very passionate about it. Well, yes, of course, I was very sort of scared about the idea of dropping right. out. Although I think I went to medical school because I had no other choice and being a writer in Guatemala those in those days was not a clear choice because you know it was the worst years of, of the war 1979 and, and uh, all writers here either were gone or were killed or were drinking I guess hiding <laughs> so there was no literary life really at least not visible right right and so yeah I was sort of scared but I decided I'd, I'd do that well, you say here, uh, where where you are, where, where where are you exactly? I'm in Guatemala City, actually not too far from where I was 40 years ago. I'm living in the same neighborhood, like uh, 100 meters away from my old house. But I've, I've, I've gone around, I was away for many years, and uh, I came back maybe, I settled back around 2000. 
back in Guatemala City. What uh, what what types of stories did you want to tell when when you had this this draw to become a writer and and you see around you um, that the uh, the the artists are, are gone or hiding or, or or whatever what what was that burning desire for you uh, what what did you want to tell what what was the story that really? that you felt like needed to be expressed No, you know, I didn't have a I I well I think at that age more likely that you don't have a story i guess you you want to emulate what you read i i, I and i was reading uh, a lot of latin american writers at the moment borges was my my hero at, at the point uh, at that point i also loved rulfo juan rulfo the mexican so i and these are uh, i would say not the representative, the main representatives of, of what was called the Latin American boom, like uh, magical realism, was not my cup of tea. More either really raw realism or or fantastic literature, which I, I think there's a clear difference between what magical realism and fantastic are. Um, yeah, yeah. What what are those differences for you? How, how do you separate the two? I think, well, I think the classic, I mean, the, the, the standard division is, you know, magical realism is, is a, a world where everything can happen. It's sort of magical, like, you know, maybe animals can communicate with humans or it's, it's a world with a different system of laws. And, and the magical is one of them. It's a common thing, a common occurrence is a part of, of everyday life. The fantastic, I would say, is our, what we call reality, common, you know, sort of boring, uh, frustrating reality where suddenly something out of the ordinary happens and sort of breaks the, the order of things. And then there's a crack in our, in our belief of what reality is and sort of probably with a shock. So the fantastic, I think, has this quality of shock or surprise or or trauma, whereas the magical realism, everything, you know, people live 100 years, like 100 years of solitude, and, you know, everything is magical. Right. So there's that's part of, of, of the reality. I would say in fantastic literature, the reality breaks. Your ideas of what is normal are broken or suddenly you know, there's a breach. Right. That I would say. So what was the, what was the first book or, or story that you wrote that you knew was, uh, was going to be published or, or would, would have a, uh, an, an audience for. Hmm. No, I never, thought, I, I was always very pessimistic, but I, at the same time, very lucky. So my first, in my first story that, Usually the, the protagonist would die and then go into a world that, that was um, either the last moment where, where you're dying and you, you you still have some consciousness. And, and that was the break into the fantastic, that, that going into that place we, we probably won't <laughs> be able to tell about. And... Um, I must say it was, a, it was a very violent reality here. People were being killed, disappeared, um, uh, whole towns were wiped out, but you could not read about it. So you had to come up with explanations. And I think that was part of that type of fantastic, you know, trying to cope with, with this world that was going crazy. I don't know how where uh, people in, in North, North America are of, of those years in Guatemala, which actually we did, was not named at that moment, but genocide was going on here. And that meant... Um, you know, wiping out of villages, disappearance of, of anyone that didn't think according to the regime or thought the regime thought or someone there thought one was a menace. That was reason enough to to kill. That was happening every day. And, you know, now we know that we know numbers, we know how it was done. But back then you couldn't even read it in the in the progressive, so to speak, press that was silenced. So that 
made for a lot of fear and, and a lot of need to explain that fear somehow. And I think that some liter- some of the fantastic literature tries to do that, you know, yeah. tries to, like dreams, you know, right. like, try to explain what's happened. Well, and I think that's always been a, a tradition in, in fantasy literature, uh, is that we, we get to tell stories that help us cope with what's going on or help us to, uh, yeah. bring some sort of, uh, explanation to what's going on to, to things that have no explanation. I mean, it, you even go back to, uh, Lord of the Rings with, with Tolkien. Um, you know, a lot of that story was made when he was, you know, in the trenches in, in World War One and, yeah. and just the, and just trying to bring some sort of sense, uh, to what's going on. I, th- I think we have a strong uh, history in, in, in fantasy literature of, uh, of doing that. And I, especially when, when you cannot spell things out because, right. you know, so you invent this system that provides explanations to what cannot be explained in reality, you know, in, in, in the, our shared reality. Right, right. Um, you came to the United States uh, a, a couple of years after that, didn't you? I, that same, actually, a year before I started, I decided I would try to write, I, I, I moved. Mm-hmm. I was invited by a friend that understood how bad it was here and who was generous enough to offer me a place to stay for a few, actually half a year. He said, you can be there until such and such date. He was going away on a long trip to Thailand and uh, opened up, you know, very kindly the opportunity to go to New York and and, um, and try to write. He knew that I wanted to write. and it was an old older friend, a friend of, of, of my, son of friends of my parents that luckily sort of knew what I was trying to do and, and um, gave me that chance. What did, what did going to New York uh, do for, for your writing? What, what, excuse me, I didn't get the... I said, what did going to New York uh, do for your writing, uh, other than giving you a chance to get, get away from Guatemala and, and kind of remove yourself from that situation? Um, what did the change of, of scenery, the change of place do for your creative process? Well, two things for me very significant. Uh, one, contact with with um, Anglo American literature that I had very little of here. Oh, of course, I had to improve my English, but I started to read mostly in English and a lot of, of um, short, short North American short story writers that I had not been acquainted with. Among them, Paul Bowles was one of the first re- books that this friend of mine offered me to read was Bowles' uh, collective story that had just came out, come out that year. So that, that was a very lucky chance for me. But I can name all the writers that I hadn't been acquainted with here, like Flannery O'Connor, yeah. especially because she also impressed me. Um, and so that, that was, and also w- w- watching movies. <laughs> a lot for someone from Guatemala, those dates where you could not see anything here that was not, you know, Hollywood or some, at some cultural centers like the Germans brought some, you know, okay German films that, that it, now that I look back, it was unlikely that they would, sh- they would never show here in a commercial theater, only in this like, um, little embassy, I mean, cultural centers and very, very small. But anyway, New York for me meant film, Acqu- being acquainted with contemporary film at the moment, documentaries and uh, experimental film that I had had no contact virtually. You mentioned Paul Bowles. Um, you went on to, uh, uh, he, he went on to translate some of your works, didn't he? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Everything happened very quickly. I, I was in New York since April and in June I was, was in, in Morocco joining a, a, an, a class from a New York college that offered uh, this a few weeks of creative writing with Bowles, which was for me was like you know I didn't know how how important those days were, but the, deciding to go there made things much easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Un- unlikely that Tangier was the, the you know my gateway to <laughs> to literature. That's so funny. Uh, so what was, what were those initial stories that, that Bowles read and, and wanted to translate into English? Well, were things that, some of the things that I wrote when I arrived in New York 
And I must say, most of them were nightmares of having been in Guatemala. You know, Guatemala was with me, but it came out in a nightmare, nightmare, series of nightmares I was having. And I, I wrote those as exercises. And I think Paul liked that, that quality of, you know, very sort of scary atmosphere. And, and that those were really, I would call them exercises, but he, he liked them and asked me if he could translate them for a, a New York small publisher that was uh, asking him for, for some writing that he didn't have at the moment. And he, he proposed mine uh, and it was accepted by, you know, freak chance. Wow. Wow. So you've got, uh, you all of a sudden go from wanting to be a writer and not really, um, knowing how to go to go about it to now, um, your, your works are getting out to a, a wider audience than you probably ever uh, imagined. What, what did that do for your confidence as a writer? Well, you know, I'm, I, I have to say I had never met a living writer <laughs> until I met Ball. So <laughs> it was a big, uh, jump and he but he was such a sort of not unpretentious and non uh, he treated everybody as equals and so it, it was seemed very natural uh, he was this much older he was 70 i believe when i met him he had this aura of a you know a venerable old man and also very friendly and very worldly and and so it was strange how how easy it seemed to connect with him. Also, he knew this part of the world. He had traveled here widely and wrote, written about Mexico and Central America. Knew the music very well. Knew so, and he also was a fan of Borges. I must say that was one of the of the points of contact with you know someone that was so different from background and and life. So suddenly, I. I I thought I could do it because he he told me, oh, you have to keep doing this. Keep sending me what you write. I, I would like to translate some more. So, it, it, you know, it felt strangely easy. Yeah. Um, a lot of your works are built um, around legends and myths of uh, of Central America and, and uh, uh, Latin culture. Um, a lot of fantasy literature that we read is, uh, you know, based around like medieval European um, culture, and it's really uh, it's really interesting to see stories that come from these uh, uh, legends and myths and and things that are are not as common to. Uh, the the general reading public, you know, it, it, it's it's like if one thing is successful, then ten other things come right behind it that kind of take that same formula. Um, and it's it's really refreshing to see um, these stories that that come out of uh, of these other um, and just as old um, stories that that have kind of been through the culture. Um, what what is it that separates? Um, these legends and myths from maybe other fantasy literature that we might be familiar with. Excuse me, I I, I don't know if you you said fantasy or fantastic. Well, I, I, I kind of use those interchangeably, but yeah, fan, fantastic. Because for me, that you know, they are very different. That, okay, that maybe um, because fantasy is more like whatever comes, like fairy tales. Right. Right. For me, fantastic literature is more. Uh, I, I don't want to, to, but but I make a difference, and I don't. I don't think I write fantasy, but I try to write what is called fantastic, which is more what uh, some of Edgar Allan Poe's. Right. So you you assume a, there's a realism behind it. It's not. Um, you're not in a magical world. It's, it's this very hard and violent and horrible world. Well, that's a great point. So, yeah, yeah, so, that's a that's a great point because we get to we, it's it's almost like we can connect with the characters more because they're like us. They're they're yeah. in places like us, but odd things happen to them. Things that are not explainable by you know science or or rational thinking. Right, right. So right. it's fantastic literature in in my mind, or what I mean when I is has is closer to madness, if you want. That magical and you know fairy tale land or Harry Potter, you know exactly, exactly. Yeah. What are some of those uh, um, uh, Latin American myths that find their way into your uh, writing? 
No, you know, that's another thing. I think in in um, Guatemala, I'm not talking about Latin America in general because they're very, uh, although we have many things in common, there are very, diff- very big differences in each. Of, of course. Guatemala is mostly an Indian, a Mayan country where a, half of the population or more don't have don't we don't share a language they are Mayan languages and also their systems of belief are very different it's, they're not Christian they, there's a, a very slight veneer of Christianity over all these Mayan people that actually still many of them anyway still practice their old religions which to us seem um, legendary or mythical but of course, I think if we look at Christianity with an anthropological eye, we would think that we also live in this, fan, you know, among myth and, and um, rather fantastic beliefs. For example, thinking that the blood of Christ becomes wine or, or bread and we eat it. <laughs> if you look at, if you were looking at uh, people from another planet, you would think, well, though they are cannibals. <laughs> 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 so... Sometimes I think we, we read myth of other people as something crazy or fantastic, and for them it's very, very natural, and it's just a way of talking sometimes. But I think that I like to play with those, you know, different areas of, of meaning and understanding and feeling. Right. I, I think that's that's fantastic, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, no pun intended. Um your new book is called Chaos, a Fable. Um, what's the story behind this book? Where did where did the idea for this come from? Well, I think most things come from the subconscious. But, but anyway, I, I had I lived in Tangier for a long time, and I, then I stopped going. And in 2014, I believe, or 15, I went back and had this sort of series of flashbacks. And because in Tangier is where I really became a writer, and you know, after Paul translated this, my first things, I went back and I kept working there, and, and really that's where I I wrote my first four or five books. Going back there to this place where I had worked so much, I thought brought brought as a you know Pavlovian reflex. I started writing immediately, and this story came out very quickly out of that um, sort of. Revisitation. Revisiting, I right. what, what is the, um, uh, who are the, who are the characters that we meet in this book? And of course, I, I will add, add that I, when I was going there, all, all the Muslim world was going through this, you know, revolution with, uh, with ISIS and, and that was in everybody's mind. Everybody was talking about it. So it made me connect the old Tangier where this hadn't, even become even occurred that it be, something like this would happen, you know, a new caliphate and all that, and all these comments around that by by Muslim people that were shocked and also scared about this brought about this this uh, the idea for this story, which so it's made of, it's really I connected with people that I hadn't seen in in almost fifteen years. Talking about the, how the world had changed and how it had gone crazy, and that's I think that's what the novel is about, and you know what what some people can do or not about that. Did you see um, parallels between what was going on there and what was going on in uh, Guatemala when you were a younger man? Well, no, only the the uncertainty, but no, I think yeah. it's a very different. Yeah, but yeah, but this this uh, sort of. Um, Yes. Were they the same kind of emotions and feelings, I guess, is what that did, did that help you connect to, to what you had gone through and felt so that you could have empathy and compassion on what they were going through? I guess, yeah. Yeah. You know, when you have lived in a country that went through through the, the kind of trauma that Guatemala has, you, it's easy to, to, to empathize with other, with other people that are seeing this approaching, yes. So who who are the characters that we meet uh, in this book, and uh, how did you inject them into what was going on? Well, you know, some some are, are I mean, they're all based on people that I 
or in different, I mean, combinations of people that I met when I lived in that part of the world. And then actual conversations with friends that, that had grown old. Uh, and um, you know, Moroccans are very communicative and, and great storytellers. So really many of the conversations and the things that you see in the book are, are copied from life. Of course, then they go somewhere else, but but the the, um, the visit to old friends and this sort of recapitulation of 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 events and of recent history pretty much goes on like in the book. In it went on, I went around and visited the people I knew, and that's when I started taking notes and thinking, okay, I want to take this somewhere else. And of course it goes <laughs> maybe too far, but, but um, yeah, it's based on my first impressions of going back to Tangier 15 years later. Uh, the, the book is translated by Jeffrey Gray. Um, what, what, uh, what language do you initially write in? Oh, I always write in Spanish. Okay. Uh, yeah. Does, you know, um, I, I know, um, other friends uh, that are bilingual and a lot of them will write in English um, that that was their second language and say that it's, it's almost difficult to write in their native tongue. Um, do you, do you have any, uh, when you sit down to write is, is Spanish, just the, the voice, uh, if you will, that of, of your writer, that, does it ever occur to you to write in English? No, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I write letters and I, I do read a lot of English and I, I, I enjoy that very much. And sometimes, especially when I'm in an English speaking country, some of the conversations creep into my writing directly in English because that's how I heard them. But I never, I never try to write in English. Uh, this happens with, with other languages, you know, after, after, the state. I lived in France for a while, and I, I. So sometimes, because you read in that language or you you live in in this language, some thoughts are appear in that. With that. Um, uh, in that language, but but I only go as far as as that, that takes me, which is a couple of lines, and then I go back into Spanish and. and uh, but I yeah. English is a very tempting language because it's, I think it's very supple. I think the fact that it's monosyllabic mostly, I mean, uh, there's a lot of short words, much shorter than the Spanish, I think, uh, makes it very tempting. But but I never uh, went over. <laughs> when, you, when you read a translation of your work, um, is there ever a point of frustration where maybe – uh, maybe there's a, a phrase or a, a term in Spanish that's just that's just better, that's just more expressive, or maybe carries more emotion. And in English, it just doesn't have the same weight. Uh, does that ever happen? Yes, but I'm not I'm not so attached to 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 the literal meaning. I do a lot of translation, and so I, I sort of. But you know, mostly I think that translators help me in, improve my writing, make it clear, <laughs> and cleaning up of extra, you know, words. So, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a, a job that I really respect and, and appreciate. And as I said, I, I do practice it as when I'm not writing, I try to get engaged in translating writer that I like and, and that I think that I can learn from. When when someone uh, has chaos a fable and they've read it and they close uh, the back cover of the book and they're finished with it, what do you hope people walk away with from this book? <laughs> well, maybe the, the, the idea that oh, this could happen after all, or something like that. You know, that that yeah. That, uh, that that we're all a little closer than than it seems sometimes, uh, and our our life experiences are not so different from one another. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book Chaos, a fable, is uh, when people are hearing this, it's out everywhere. I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, if people are just learning about you and your work, is there a place where they can connect with you online, learn more about you, dig into your back catalog, and all that good stuff? 
you know, I don't, I try, you catch me on a I don't, I'm not, um, very internet, uh, oriented. So I guess, I guess if you put up my name, they, they will, there's a Wikipedia thing and, um, and I think Amazon, no, I'm not being fair. Amazon opened an author page where I think there's some information. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm looking at your Amazon page right now and there's a, uh, there's a, a, a great number of your books on there. So I'm going to link that up in the show notes where people can go and, uh, buy the new book, of course, but also, uh, dig into the other works that you've got, uh, out there. Uh, Rodrigo, this has been so much fun talking. Um, thank you so much for taking thank time to come on the show. It's very kind of you to have me, Hank. And um, I look forward to meeting you sometime. Absolutely. Missing Wings by Andrea Lumen. Born with an ability the Villa de people of Madar believe make her one of the first to be blessed by God, Katrina's destiny unravels when her father is poisoned and her mother steals her into the human world to hide among those who hate her kind. In a near-fatal attempt to return home, Katrina is stripped of her wings. The poison meant to kill her father leaves him in a degenerative state. When her eldest brother discovers she has survived, he orders her to stay in hiding. She must wait, concealed in the human world, until the danger of their father's uncontrolled rages is contained. Grown and adapted to the human world, Katrina encounters one of her kind. The promise of home and the first love leads her into a situation capable of starting war among the villages. Will a human upbringing, mistakes, and the loss of her abilities bar her from reclaiming her heritage? Will unraveling the mystery of her mother's betrayal lead her family into an even greater danger? Missing Wings by Andrea Lumen. The Locust, books 1-3 to three by Ralph Kern. The complete Locust series, an epic tale of mystery, survival, exploration, intrigue, and war. The cruise ship MS Atlantica is lost. On these strange and uncharted seas where even the compass shows the sun rising to the west, Atlantica's passengers and crew must do what it takes to survive. In Unfathomed, Atlantica arrives in a strange new world. Unable to locate land with no way to contact home, they must find new allies, fend off relentless enemies, and discover the horrifying truth behind the Locust. The future of humanity will be decided as the fleet confronts the architect of the Locust. Not everyone will survive the desperate final battle. The Locust box set contains all three action-packed novels in this best-selling science fiction thriller series, Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris. Acclaimed for great characters, thrilling action, technical accuracy, and a compelling sense of mystery. Buy it today. The Complete Locust Series by Ralph Kern. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night, give me your answer. Which one would Mom kill us for watching? said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, Child of the Jackal? The Omen! And we might have time for Omen, too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reebok, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. 
They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any. And Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about, hmm, scary blackout? Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? He whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 